Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. And it's uh, my pleasure to welcome to today's program Daniel McHugh, who is VP of uh, Business Development at Ryder. And we're going to talk about a new perspective on dedicated transportation. Uh, dedicated transportation is certainly a hot topic these days, uh, uh, not only with uh, shippers, but with 3PLs as well. And uh, we're going to have a good conversation uh, around why that is and why and how is dedicated transportation different today, let's say, than it was maybe five or even 10 years ago. Uh, so I'm very excited to, to uh, kind of dive into this conversation. Uh, just as a reminder, those of you that are joining us live today, if you would like to ask a question, uh, you can do so via the question button or via the chat feature. And uh, I'll keep an eye on that. And uh, certainly if we've got time and uh, there are some good uh, uh, questions out there, we'll, uh, we'll weave them into the, um, into the conversation. Um, and with that, Daniel, welcome to the program. Well, thanks, Adrian. Thanks for uh, for inviting me. Um, I'm uh, excited about having this conversation. So, great, great. Well, great to have you. Um, you know, before we we dive into the topic of of dedicated transportation, uh, I always like to start off with you know asking my guests the, the same question, and that is you know trying to get an understanding of how you got started in the in the supply chain logistics industry. So. Tell us a little bit about your, your career path, how and why you got involved in the logistics industry, and, and about your current role uh, there at Ryder. Okay, well, you know, I've been with Ryder quite a while. I'm, I've been with Ryder 21 years uh, this last September, and um, I really got into logistics uh, by accident. It, it wasn't something that I was uh, studying for or a career I was looking for. Um, it really started, um, you know, as, as a way to help pay for college. Um, I started uh, part-time working uh, for a couple of other transportation companies, um, working, um, you know, in their dispatch office uh, or, on their, or on their cross dock. And uh, while I was in college, I, I got a job at Ryder, um, and really in the Detroit area, working on um, one of our JIT, Automotive Just-in-Time Cross Docks. And I did that at night, and it was uh, a full-time job for me. Um, and I was going to school full-time during the day, so it was a pretty hectic time, uh, to say the least. But, um, you know, studying, uh, I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't looking for a career in logistics. I was actually studying broadcasting. I was studying uh, radio, TV, film. Um, but when I graduated, uh, I had to make a decision. I, I already had a full-time job. It just uh, was at night. <laughs> but it was a full-time job versus uh, trying to find a new job and start over, uh, you know, start in a new industry in, in the radio, TV, film industry. Um, so I really I looked at, um, you know, bird in the hand versus uh, two in the bush and decided to, to really uh, – I liked where I was working. I liked the people, and I liked uh, the company. So, um, I had uh, I had black hair and, and more of it at the time too. Someone mentioned that to me yesterday. They said, "I remember when we first, you know, started here. <laughs> we both had black hair, and we had more of it." So, um, but um, but anyways, I, I just started thinking about the work I was doing at the time and and ways to improve it. Ways to improve the the solution we were giving to our customers. And and it's really sort of snowballed from there. I started, uh, was asked, because we were solving problems, operational problems, I was asked to do more. Uh, so the company really recognized uh, the value uh, of the individual uh, contributors and, and gave them, you know, gave us more opportunities to do more things. So well, helped launch new auto plants, uh, uh, supply chain networks. That was very beneficial. Those are very complex logistics networks to start from scratch. Um, I got into managing our engineering groups, uh, which was a whole nother, uh, whole nother uh, valuable uh, service uh, that we provide. But it was valuable to me because it taught me about, you know, thinking about the data and thinking about the strategy versus the executional, operational, tactical stuff. So. Uh, so that was very valuable. I got into helping develop new solutions and new services for Ryder. So um, really spent a lot of time uh, in operations uh, and, and engineering in the first decade. Um, 
And uh, actually, one of the things I'm very proud of is uh, we started in the, in the Detroit area what we call the OMC, Operations Management Center. Um, and really what it was, was we had, a, we had a, uh, an automotive OEM that uh, we made, was making some strategic decisions to change. Uh, we were working for them. They were making some strategic decisions to change uh, providers. Um, and so we were forced uh, with you know, shutting down a, a very large dispatch operation or figuring out how we could leverage that and sell that service offering to, to, to more automotive tier one customers. <clears throat> and and uh, what we, we were able to do that, we were able to take a, two tier one customers and replace that lost business with these two tier one customers and manage them with one infrastructure. One, uh, you know, this is this was complicated at the time. This is probably uh, 2000, uh, 1999, 2000, because, I mean, these networks are highly designed and highly, you know, very, a lot of precision in how these networks move in the automotive sector uh, because of the just-in-time nature, um, down to the part level, what part is picked up uh, at what time of the day what time of the day that part will be delivered, what's the quantity, what's the right packaging for it, how many layers are there on a skid, you know, all this kind of this data that's very specific to managing a just-in-time network. We said, let's figure out how to take two of these very complex networks and manage them together uh, with the same managers and the same infrastructure and the same computer systems and the same dispatch systems, etc. So we're able to do that and and leverage the best of uh, you know the people and the processes and the systems really didn't support it, but uh, we figured out a way to make it work, and that grew into one of our uh, we call them control towers uh, that Ryder had. We have two uh, you know, two control towers I'll call them, you know, premier control towers in the industry. One is in Detroit here, in the, in where I office in Novi, and one is in Dallas. And they grew up kind of simultaneously for two different two different logistics models. One in automotive, which was, you know, like I said before, it's a very structured, very specific, um, pre-planned is the word uh, is the words I would use, versus the one we we launched in in Dallas Fort Worth, which is supports very dynamic networks, uh, networks that are you know um, retail networks where you don't know what you're going to ship until. You know, the orders uh, come in for that day, and sometimes they come in multiple times a day. You'll get orders in the morning and more orders in the afternoon, and you have to figure out um, how to how to ship all that product in the most efficient and, and cost effective, and, and, and you know, with a focus on service and, as possible. So, you're, so that's a very dynamic network, and then we've got this control tower in, in Detroit where we're where we're started managing, you know, very pre-planned and uh, high degree of detailed uh, networks. Um, and you know what's, that grew into about a 15 to 20 account operation in Detroit, started with just those two. Uh, we kept everybody employed at the time. Uh, and really where it's gone now is both of these control towers are almost interchangeable because what we've been able to do, well, I used to have a colleague that said dynamic networks are a victim of logistics amnesia because they forget what they did yesterday. Um, and so, you know, his point was that there's processes and um, approaches in a pre-planned network that are applicable to a dynamic network and vice versa. There's processes and uh, techniques and systems that really help drive a dynamic network that you can use in a, in a uh, pre-planned network. So we've really sort of built these Control towers have evolved, have been built and evolved into now where they're they're highly flexible and they can handle you know different types of customers, not only multiple customers on the same platforms, but different types of customers with different uh, network challenges. So um, I didn't mean to take us off track here, uh, but you know it's just kind of the things I've been involved in. Uh, in, in my years at Ryder and, and only been in business development about three years now. Uh, most of, like I said, the rest of my career here has been uh, in operations, trying to solve these these problems. But it's 
I'll tell you what, uh, it's it's very rewarding work. I mean, logistics is, uh, like I said, I wasn't looking to do it, but it is, you know, I found it so rewarding because solving customers' problems are, that's just, it's very rewarding. I mean, when you solve a problem, that's, uh, you get a great, uh, uh, it's a great feeling that you get because you were able to solve, you know, solve these problems. And none of these customers' problems, uh, there are similarities, but they're never the same. Their networks are different. They're, the geographies are different. Their modes of transport are different. Um, their strategic initiatives are different. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of different uh, variables that go into solving uh, these logistics problems. And uh, like I said, it's highly rewarding. So got into it by accident, but uh, loved all of it. So um, so here now I'm talking to you. So I'm at the pinnacle now. <laughs> Great, great. Well, I can tell from, uh, um, uh, you know, obviously from the examples that you gave, that you, you're very passionate about, um, y you know, what you do and, and kind of the industry that you kind of uh, found yourself in. And obviously, you've been you've been at it for all these years. So, um, you know, that's fantastic. And of course, the, the you, you know, the topic of, of control towers is another one of those hot, you know, buzz, uh, you know, hot topics, you know, today in the industry and certainly something that we can um, you know, talk about it in more detail in, in a future uh, future episode. Um, you know, obviously, in, in your current role, you, you've got the opportunity to speak with a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of shippers. Um, what are you hearing from them in, in terms of kind of the transportation challenges that, that they're facing, or so the strategies that they're trying to put in place, you know, for this coming year? Is there, a, you know, a common overriding, overriding objective or, or common threads that you hear, you know, from shippers these days? Um, yeah, the, there's always been, you know, sort of the staple uh, theme has always been cost containment and cost reduction. So you you continually hear that theme, and I've heard that, you know, for, for two decades. I've been been working with with Ryder, um, uh, but more co more recently, the, the the common message is has been that you know the logistics portion of their business uh, was always a necessary component, but did not provide a you know a strategic advantage to to them traditionally. Now they're talking about um, their supply chains more strategically than I've heard them talk about them in the past. Um, for example, a week ago I had a discussion with a, a four maybe a five billion dollar um, company that uh, when I asked them about um, you know. Give me an idea what your strategic objectives are for the near term. Uh, one of the things they talked about was their, you know, their five bill, roughly five billion dollar company, and they, their goal is to grow. They used to be a seven billion dollar company. Their goal is to grow back to the seven billion dollar mark without borrowing any cash. Um, you know, they wanted to do it with the cash they had or the cash they could generate, uh, you know, on their own. So. <clears throat> You know, I asked him, "What if?" I mean, you know, I like I like using okay, so, um, having discussions in terms of hypotheticals because it gets it gets uh, gets the prospects or the customers out of their you know uh, their predisposed uh, paradigms, right? And it helps them think outside of what what they know today. But I asked the question, "What if I could take out? What if you know we could collectively take out one day of your order to delivery time?" What does that mean uh, in terms of cash flow? Um, and just think about that that discussion. Um, their five billion dollar company, one day is about thirteen and a half million dollars uh, in sales. So if you can get that cash one day sooner than you did before, now one day is a lot. I mean, you take out one full day. Uh, but you can start chipping away at it. You can start looking at how they move their product and um, how fast do you move it? How long do you hold it at your at your facility? Uh, you know, why do you hold it that? You know, hold it as long as you do. You can start having these discussions with these customers on a strategic level and start trying to solve the problem. How do I maximize cash flow? And you know, he said to me, "You're you know, I talked to a lot of logistics companies. You're the first one that ever has said anything about cash flow." Um, but they do they do talk about their s supply chains nowadays in terms of um, uh, in terms of strategic value to the company, uh, whether it be cash flow or improving service or 
um, you know, cost containment is something, I mean, not only cost containment uh, today, but, you know, what's going to happen next year, what's going to happen two years or three years down the road, how do I make sure if, you know, the, the, the overall supply chain cost is going up three to five percent a year, how do I keep mine at two to three percent a year, you know, how do I, how do I hedge, um, so those are the kinds of discussions that we're having with, um, with, uh, with companies today versus, you know, the, you know, the tradition, it's always been, you know, can you do it for less? That's always there. I, I spend, you know, X today. Can you do it for X minus something? Um, and that's not always, uh, that's not always the case. Uh, but if you talk about it in terms of strategy, there's ways I can do it for X, but get all these other benefits as well. So that's kind of what I've been when seeing. Yeah, great. Companies, uh, let me, so companies with private fleets, uh, you know, they're, they're looking, a lot of them are looking to get out of the private fleet business. So, uh, you know, and for all the strategic reasons, but also, you know, the assets they have on their books, maybe today, the, the driver, the driver hiring and retention challenges, the, the CSA challenges, the regulatory changes, like the hours of service rules, um, there's more complex engine technology mandates coming down to, you know, based on emission standards. So there's all these uh, extraordinary, uh, you know, distract, I don't know what a good word for them is, but uh, for somebody who's making a product to, to have to focus on all these other non-value added things the way they look at them, right? It doesn't help me increase the value of my product at all, but I have to spend all this time on it. Maybe I can get someone else to do that. For me. So that's another uh, more recent discussion. Uh, we've seen an increase in, in just those general discussions about their fleets. Yeah, no, great. I, I think, I, you know, great points. I mean, I hear the same thing from a lot of shippers as well in terms of, uh, you know, really looking at the role of supply chain and, and even more specifically transportation from a more strategic perspective and higher level perspective. I, I love the connection with cash flow because that's another area that I see as well as is being able to speak the language of the CFO, right? Being able to, you know, link the role of supply chain and, and logistics and transportation to items on the, you know, the balance sheet or the PL and, and see how, you know, the uh, you know the connection between those and how you can influence those financial uh, those financial metrics. And certainly the the items you brought up on on uh, you know private fleets are all you know top of mind for for fleet operators today. So so, so let's talk about you know dedicated and, and you know uh, you, you know fleet management, uh, which like I mentioned at the onset is, is certainly getting a lot of attention today from from shippers as well as logistic service providers. And you know at least from my perspective, you know historically I've used you know companies have used dedicated fleets, you know in very specific lanes, right where um, you've got very predictable and consistent volume uh, and, and where service is, is very important. Um, but I also see that companies you know, kind of traditionally have also viewed you know dedicated fleet as, as kind of uh, kind of the exception or a special case, right? So they, they've kind of you know here's our dedicated operations and then here's our common carrier operations and they kind of kept those you know separate um, and kind of in a siloed, fragmented way. Is that still the case today from, from your, you know, perspective? Or are companies starting to view and leverage dedicated fleets, private fleets, you know, differently? And, and if so, how? Oh, great, great question, because uh, they absolutely are thinking about it differently. And, um, you know, they're thinking about their supply chain in its totality, not just uh, the dedicated or the private fleet piece and and the common carrier piece. They're thinking about it uh, in terms of you know what is the best way to uh, you know to to manage all of these issues. Right? You've got uh, you've got uh, driver hiring issues and retention issues. And I was looking at some numbers. Uh, uh, last week, where the expectation is, you know, the industry will be short 350,000 drivers in the next couple of years. We're already experiencing a shortage now. So, what are your strategies, uh, uh, you know, to 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 be prepared when it gets that bad? Um, what you know, costs or capacity is with that, you know, costs will go up. So, 
uh, cost of moving products will go up from a four higher standpoint. Um, you know, uh, what are your strategies there? So um, you know, rather than thinking about all these things separately, they're thinking about them collectively, more strategically, right? So uh, it really is a nice fit with where Ryder, uh, what we've been able to do, because we used to think about these separately as well. We, we like I said before, we have you know, a control tower uh, service offering in the Fort Worth area that was a dynamic for hire a model, right? So everything that ran in that model is even designed to run, engineered to run with four higher carriers. The way it was you know, um, solutioned when the orders came in, the way those orders are communicated to carriers, the way those carriers accept or reject orders, um, the way those those uh, orders were tracked uh, to, through delivery and even the way exceptions were managed. Um, as well as you know, in, a, in a private fleet environment or a dedicated environment, you don't have things like uh, acceptance uh, or rejecting of tenders. You take, I mean, you've got the capacity there to take the tender, to take the order. That's why it's there. You have a very specific need. So, you know, companies are thinking about their networks um, more holistically, um, and uh, you know, and you know, it really is a nice fit because, like I said before, you want to get the balance between. Um, between a flexible network and a fixed capacity network. And so you start, you can design, you can take that whole network, uh, where's, where, where's the product originating from, where's it going to, what are all of the, I call them business rules, what are those business rules that say, you know, it has to ship by this time of day, it has, the order has to be in by this time of day, shipment by this time of day, delivery by this day and this time of day in this fashion with this type of equipment and so what are all those business rules that make up the logistics parameters you lock those down and then say okay now what's the best mix so what's where's the right use of a dedicated fleet and where's the best use of, of, of four higher fleets um, and 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 even modal where's the best use of LTL in this model where's, uh, where's the best use of small package in this model um, and you know, those decisions are made based on, you know, is there a special need or a special requirement, um, you know, special handling of the product, uh, a special equipment type to, to, to transport the product. Uh, geography is very important. Where's the origins? Where are the destinations? Uh, what's going on in those origins and destinations? I mean, uh, uh, diversifying a dedicated network or, a, you know, a private fleet network into multiple geographies is helpful because then you're not trying to hire all your drivers in one spot. So is there a way to kind of spread things out a little bit and hire some in Indianapolis and some in, in Buffalo and some in Chicago? Uh, or do you need them all in you know, Indianapolis? Um, so looking at it from that standpoint, uh, where's the right balance of inbound and outbound uh, product moving? Um, where you know a dedicated fleet, you can lock down a certain amount of capacity in your network by matching those things together. Um, and you know, looking at the data historically, where where are the peaks and where are the valleys? Uh, what kind of you know speed are you trying to get out of your network? Um, you know, uh, backhaul potential. Uh, there's just there's so many variables, but but in general, I mean, companies are looking at this more as a as a as a uniform, more holistically, I guess is the is the way to describe it um, than they have in the past. Um, and uh, and thinking about the fleet as a uh, not as a that's private fleet over here and this is all for hire over here but say what's the best mix of and this can be managed dynamically and that, I think that's the real value right but what's the best mix of assets uh, and uh, and asset free uh, providers so what's that best mix and then day to day hour to hour where's the best use of them so rather than locking down a fleet on this lane A to B. You're going to run this lane all the time. Uh, I'm going to put a fleet in a geography, and I'm going to use it wherever the biggest need is in that geography. And I'm going to make those decisions based on a whole a whole series of business rule criteria. Yeah, the last point I think was uh, uh, you know 
kind of something new and different. I, I, you know, the fact that I, uh, you know, I think you said it right. I think when a lot of folks think about private fleet or have traditionally used a private fleet, that's, you know, they've got very specific lanes that they assign that, you know, fleet to. And, and the reality is that today, a lot of, the, you know, transportation networks are becoming much more uh, dynamic, right? You know, cus- you know uh, companies are picking up new customers or they're losing customers or they're picking up new suppliers. You know, so the networks are becoming much more fluid and dynamic. And, um, you know, the, the, the role of a dedicated fleet kind of needs to change in that environment, it seems like. And it seems like, you know, based on what you said, you know, you know kind of savvy shippers are, are kind of looking at it, you know, that way. I mean, the way I think about it, if, if, if the goal is to create a more flexible transportation solution, you know, one that can respond to kind of more dynamic changes in your transportation environment or your transportation requirements, that, that leverages both, you know, a dedicated fleet as well as well as common carriers, then, you know, how does a shipper, how does a company go about developing it? You know, in other words, how does how does a company get started? Uh, what data and capabilities do you need, you know, to, to make it work? And, and how do you measure success and improvement? I mean, what, what are the metrics that you need to have in place? That's a good question, especially the metrics question, because um, I think a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, companies will go down this path without defining what success is before they start. They know what they, they kind of know what they want, right? They want this dynamic, more dynamic network that leverages the best of both, uh, you know, for hire and, and, and private fleets or dedicated fleets. But, but how do you know it's a, it's a good model for you and how do you know it's uh, successful after you've done it for six months or a year or two years? So. Let me start with the metrics question. The, um, you know, one of the things we've kind of learned to do uh, is try to define success uh, before we even start, before we launch. So, so we actually have this conversation with customers, you know, starting the implementation process. We say the very first thing we want to do is we want to define success. Uh, so describe it to me, and usually you get blank stares. <laughs> What does it look like, right? And, and you get blank stares. But then, as you as you talk about it, you start to you know, uh, you know, kind of, you know, solidify what the success looked like. And and um, you know, they always start with cost per mile, right? I want to reduce my cost per mile. Uh, but that's really just uh, in this kind of more uh, complex network, it really doesn't tell you a whole lot. I can raise your cost per mile and lower your total cost per delivery. So. Uh, what is, you know, so start with the perfect order. What does a perfect order look like? Uh, let's define that, you know, it's the right product and the right time and, you know, in perfect condition, you know, but, you know, what are those parameters that make it perfect? How much, you, know, you got an order on, you know, day one and you delivered it on day eight, uh, you, know, <laughs> uh, you know, but you had a, you know, a nine day order to delivery, so it was a day early, really good, or it was a day early really not on time. I mean, you got to have all of those conversations. But so the perfect order um, and things that fall out of that are, you know, uh, order to delivery time, uh, cost per delivery or cost per pound. Um, so you're looking at, you know, what does it cost me to deliver something rather than, or you know, to provide this service on an individual basis versus, you know, just generic metrics like what's my cost per mile or my cost per um, Whatever that metric is. So, um, the one one we toyed with, and uh, and uh, I, I really like it, is a cost per ton mile. So you take um, the the you know how much product am I shipping, uh, and how far do I have to ship it? Uh, and so it really gives you a, a look at what your network looks like. Um, you know what your network looks like by distance and by and by and by time. So. So getting the right metrics is is very important, but focusing on um, ones that drive the right behavior of the network. So uh, you know, like a cost per delivery is is very important, and not focusing. I mean, cost per mile is important, but it doesn't really tell you uh, it doesn't tell you a lot about the network. It doesn't really tell you a lot about are you really improving uh, my cost per delivery or or my service or whatever those whatever those 
uh, elements of it are. But getting started is, it, okay, so that's the metric piece. So getting started is typically very difficult because uh, most, cust most companies don't have very good logistics data. Um, and you know, having good, clean logistics data is important to trying to change the way things move. It's very hard to change something if you don't really know how it runs, how it operates today. Uh, so this is the, the single, in a lot of cases, it's the single biggest hurdle to get over is just getting good data. Uh, what is happening today and sort of benchmarking, um, benchmarking what it looks like and what it costs. Um, and like I said, it's, it's hard to do. And even companies that have private fleets most of the time don't have good cost data around what that fleet costs them to operate. They know how much they pay the drivers and they know how much fuel they use and they know um, how much the equipment costs. But beyond that, there's they don't really know, uh, you know how much management cost is associated with this because management is you know part of plant production costs or they don't know, uh, you know drivers are on vacation and truck sits and they use common carriers to move that product that day or whatever they do, they don't capture that cost. Um, so, you know, there's IT costs, payroll and billing, you know, there's all kinds of costs that insurance uh, that they don't typically have, uh, you know, in the, in the P&L, that's a, you know, that's a, a dedicated fleet P&L. So again, building that baseline is uh, typically, the baseline's typically lacking and building it is the most important first step. Um, and that usually takes time. Um, and, uh, and and we do things for customers like, you know, because you don't have very good, you know, data, let us, uh, you know, let us pay your bills for a month. We'll just pay you. You tend to see freight bills. We'll pay them. We'll build, we'll build a database for two months. From that database, we'll build a baseline. And from that baseline, we'll start identifying uh, ways to improve that, improve that network, uh, or you know, give us your trip sheets for your private fleet for a month. We'll key. We actually got software here that you can scan in, and it'll it'll build soft copies of electronic copies of that data right off right off handwritten pieces of paper. So, um, you know, we can we can build databases uh, and spend the time building the databases because. Well, that's to, that's the single most important thing is having good clean data uh, at the beginning, and that's typically what's lacking. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I've been uh, kind of in the analyst logistics industry now for 15 plus years, and uh, it it's still it's a little bit kind of depressing that you know the same issues that companies had 15 years ago, and and arguably even longer than that. Uh, in terms of being able to create that baseline, being able to have, you know, timely, accurate, complete data information to really, at the end of the day, make smarter decisions, uh, right, uh, you know, moving forward. Uh, or in this case, you know, just trying to create a baseline. It's still, you know, a challenge that, that many companies face. So it, it's kind of interesting to, to, to hear that that's still kind of the, uh, you know, the challenge for, for many companies uh, in, in this area. Uh, I just want to remind you know the folks attending live that uh, you know we're, we're kind of have a couple of two or three more questions here. But if you do have a question for for Daniel, uh, now's the time to do so. You can do so via the submit a question button or the the live chat feature. Um, so so Daniel, another area that's getting a lot of buzz these days that kind of links into dedicated fleet and private fleets is, is sustainability and uh, alternative, particularly around alternative fuel vehicles and and especially with regards to uh, natural uh, gas powered uh, trucks. From your perspective, is sustainability playing a, a role in, in dedicated fleet, private fleet decisions? And where are we today with, you know, natural gas powered, you know, trucks and, and where are we heading? What does the future look like in this area? Uh, good. It's a good question. Yes, it is. Uh, it is a topic of discussion with uh, many, uh, many customers. Um, and they all have different reasons for it. But um, you know, but it, you know, natural gas aside, I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, vehicles, I'm talking about. But 
but sustainability and carbon footprint, uh, you know, that's been a discussion for, uh, you know, for the better part of uh, the last decade, right? Um, and companies have been thinking about their carbon footprint and how do they improve that carbon footprint. Um, and, you know, even before the natural gas vehicles were, um, uh, you know, available to, to do the kind of fleet work that is needed in many cases. Uh, we've been working, we've worked with uh, customers to try to measure uh, their carbon footprint and, and improve that and do that through, uh, you know, engineering more efficient networks, engineering, um, making that one of the, you know, success criteria on the front end uh, of a solution development uh, where you're thinking about how do I close loops? How do I uh, take empty uh, capacity and, and fill it so that it's not wasted uh, capacity? Um, what does, you know, dedicated fleets can help with that. I mean, the, you know, there's a common carriers, you know, you think about a common carrier network, they run, if you read their annual reports, they'll tell you they're running, you know, 19, 20, 22 percent empty, empty miles. So if you can engineer a dedicated fleet that runs less than that, you're, you're making an improvement on that carbon footprint, uh, as well as uh, you know now we're getting advantage of all the all the MPG improvements from the, the fairings that go on the trucks and uh, you know, the type of tires that go on the trucks and, and, and uh, the engine technology even the, even in the diesel equipment we've seen uh, you know the diesel equipment move you know move from you know, six miles per gallon up to seven, seven, two, seven, three, just with just with the engine technology improvements and um, and the type of uh, equipment um, uh, options you can put on. So uh, that that's uh, that continues to be a discussion. And uh, you know, with diesel fuel at four dollars a gallon, you know, improving from six to seven to seven and a half uh, mpgs. Uh, uh, you know, on a tractor trailer is a big, there's a lot of money there. Um, so that's, that's one piece. Now the natural gas piece uh, is gaining a lot of momentum. Uh, we have a lot of requests to look at um, putting in natural gas equipment, either uh, compressed natural gas or, or liquid natural gas. Um, but, um, uh, you know, it's got to be the right profile. It's got to have the right network profile. The miles are too low. Uh, on on average, on a piece of on a tractor, um, you're not going to get the benefit uh, out of out of the natural gas equipment. Uh, you have to have enough miles really uh, to make the natural gas equipment pay off, because it is it's a, it's a lot more expensive than a traditional you know, diesel engine right now. Uh, they do have the the newer technology. Uh, I forget I think it's a 12 liter engine that's come out uh, more recently. Uh, is uh, is giving us flexibility in hauling heavier loads where you know we couldn't before the the, the technology I think it was a nine liter engine we were using uh, it's fine for loads that are you know uh, twenty five thousand pounds but if you start getting up to thirty five or forty thousand pound loads that's a difficult engine to to have um, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't. It's not as efficient as it could be. So now there's there's new engine technology coming out uh, that gives you that capacity to haul the heavier loads uh, with natural gas. Um, and uh, if you have enough miles, the the model is a good model for most for most customers. Um, and the thing that's interesting, most interesting about it, I I think, is the fuel. You know, diesel fuel is going up and down every day. Uh, natural gas is not. Natural gas is is stable. Uh, and natural gas, I mean, we can lock in natural gas for a year. We can tell a customer that, uh, you know, you're going to pay $2.35 you know, per per gallon equivalent for the, for the next 12 months and then we'll change. So from a budgeting standpoint, um, for customers, there's a big advantage in knowing what your costs are going to be uh, from a fuel standpoint, um, you know, next year. So that, so that piece of it, it, there's a lot of value. So... You know, long story short, with the right network, there's uh, uh, there's a lot of value in the natural gas equipment. Um, um, and beyond that, there's other things you can do. Uh, you really want to 
you're really concerned about your carbon footprint. There's other there's other ways to engineer the network so that you are you're, you're making the best use of of your assets and uh, minimizing that impact. Great, great. No, I think uh, th th that last piece I hadn't really heard before or thought about in terms of being, uh, you know, that predictability in, in the cost, if you will, and being able to lock in on that that price. You know, you know obviously for a lot of transportation uh, managers, yeah, you, you've got a lot of headaches when it comes to fuel surcharges uh, and, and those types of costs and trying to budget for those and manage those throughout the year. And uh, from a budgeting standpoint, as, as you said, if, if you're able to have that predictability and that knowledge going into the year of, of what that cost components going to be, I think it's a, it's certainly a benefit. Um, so, so to wrap up kind of the, the discussion here around, uh, uh, you know, dedicated um, and, and more broadly just transportation strategies, um, you know, how would you, and kind of as a way to, you know, provide those listening with kind of a framework to think about where they are on the, on the maturity level, if you will, around this, I mean, how would you complete the following statement? You know, you have a well integrated and flexible transportation solution if, if what? what? What are some of the things that, what are some of the attributes that companies should look for within their own operations to say, yes, it looks like we're, we're, we're moving, we're kind of moving towards best in class or we're, we're high up in the maturity level with regards to the way we're managing our transportation operations? That's a great question. Um... You know, and I, I would answer it this way. I'd say you know, uh, you have, you know, I think you said well integrated and flexible transportation solution. If your order management process uh, from end to end uh, can be executed the same way regardless of the mode of transport, I think that's that's the way I describe that. So, you know, if your if your order management process doesn't change based on what mode of transportation you're using. You're going to manage that order in the same way and you've got a pretty order. You, you've got a flexible network because that order can go uh, you know, multiple different directions, uh, you know, on, on different equipment with different transit times uh, and still be managed under the same process umbrella. I think that once you're doing that, you've taken out a lot of the variability, you've taken out a variability is risk. Right, so uh, the more variability you can take out, uh, the less risk you have of failure, um, and the more predictable, you know, your solution is going to be. So, um, so that's the way I would do. That. Does that answer your question? I hope. Yeah, no, I think I think that's uh, that's a great because I think that is that is one, um, you know, that's a high level enough kind of answer that um, you know folks can really you know, bring up at a Friday meeting, you know, and say, hey, you know, from an order management standpoint, you know, are we flexible enough? Are we integrated enough to, you know, meet customer requirements regardless of mode, regardless of where we fulfill from, so on and so forth? Uh, I think that's a great way to kind of frame it uh, around that. Um, you know, so to wrap up, you know, in shifting gears completely, I'll, I'll end with a, a, another question that I like to ask all my guests. You know, so I always I always start by asking how you got into the industry and, and tell us a little bit of your career path. I like to end with your words of advice or recommendations for those that are just getting started in the industry. You know, young professionals that are um, you know just getting started in the supply chain logistics field, or even students that might be watching who are um, you know uh, studying supply chain logistics, looking for a career. Um, you know, after they graduate in, in in this field, what words of advice would you give to them to uh, you know, help them pave a, a more successful career moving forward. Okay, I, uh, that's a great question. I, uh, I hope you can hear me because it seemed like while you're asking the question, you're breaking up a little bit. Uh, but I'll, I'll just continue. The, uh, you know, for me, what I've told, what I've, what I've uh, told folks who have asked me this question before is, you know, uh, just actions and experience uh, are the best teachers uh, and and uh, the most valuable. So so how do you get that? So you know, can you do internships? Can you 
uh, I'll tell you what, there's, there's so much uh, companies like Ryder, and there's, there's you know, a few of them out, out there in the logistics uh, arena. We can use help in almost every, every functional group. Uh, and we do internships. Uh, you know, we have internships uh, for all of those groups. So uh, get into the industry and just try it because, like I said before, it's, it's a very rewarding industry. Uh, because you know you're solving problems and, and you're uh, when you're you know you're networking with what's, what's one of the great things about this in you know the three PL uh, type industry is we're talking to uh, companies in a wide variety of other industries so they're in metals and they're in oil and gas exploration and they're in retail and they're in CPG and they're in building materials and they all have different uh, things going on in their industries uh, you know at the same time so as we're talking to them uh, it's 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 incredibly interesting to, to learn about what they're dealing with and what they're struggling with and it's completely different a lot of times than uh, at the same time than a different industry. I mean, you know, think about the building industry, what they've been dealing with the last uh, you know, four or five years um, versus uh, oil and gas exploration in the, in, in the U.S. Those, those two industries have been on different trajectories and their problems are uh, completely different. So uh, getting but you're you're still be you're still able to solve and improve the solution for both of those industries. Um, they're just different, uh, and it's incredibly interesting. And you know, I would encourage if you're thinking about folks, if you're thinking about getting into the 3PL or the logistics industry, um, more than think about it, act on it. Go go ask. You know, network, talk to people, dialogue, uh, ask for internships. Ask uh, you know uh, where you can help. Find out who's you know starting a new piece of business here, a new piece of business there, because that's where we need. Everybody needs talent, and they need people with a lot of energy and a lot of uh, you know commitment to improve things. And, and you won't be disappointed. It's it's a very rewarding, uh, very rewarding business. So, I, 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 just to sum it up, I'd say just you know, act, go do, go talk to people, go network. Get involved and get that experience because uh, I think uh, I think you won't turn back once you once you do that. Great, great words of advice, Daniel. Certainly, a lot of uh, uh, opportunities uh, in the industry, and uh, uh, certainly, you know, you, you started out uh, in journalism and, and radio and TV, and, and here you are uh, today on a, on a medium that uh, didn't really exist. Uh, you know, when you came out of college, and uh, gosh, didn't even exist when I came out of college. And uh, so you come, you've come full circle, Daniel. You're you're on TV now, and uh, and you were able to have a career in logistics too. So uh, I want to thank you for your time. Excellent, uh, you know, points today. Uh, thank you for sharing your insights and taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, to be with us today. Well, you're welcome, Adrian. And let me just let me add to that. You know, when I was in college, what one of my one of the professors was giving us a lecture once, and he says, you know, one day uh, you're going to be able to watch a movie over your phone, over your phone line. And one day, and I, I was just, that was so, uh, you know, this was in the early 90s. It, for me, it was like, really? I talked on my phone. How can I watch a movie over my phone line? He says, you know, so it really has come a long way where we're having this dialogue now. Uh, virtually over our phone lines. I mean, you know, it's almost the same technology. So, but thanks again for the invitation. I hope I hope that was informative and uh, you know it's fairly high level, right? So um, you know people can find me on uh, on LinkedIn if you want to send me a message. I'll be happy to talk to you and we'll get into more detail if you'd like. So, thanks, Adrian. Great, thank you, Daniel. And uh, just to echo that point. You know, we didn't get any live questions today, but anyone who's watching this episode uh, on demand, if you do have a question or comment for, for Daniel, um, go ahead to TalkingLogistics.com, find the, uh, the, the episode there, and you can, you know, post a comment or a question there, and I'm sure Daniel will be happy to, uh, uh, to answer it. So, again, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us today, uh, and look, certainly look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day. Thanks.